Welcome to Journey Church. Our church exists to help people find God, experience freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. If you have any questions about Journey Church, please visit us at ourjourney.tv. Welcome home. Welcome to Journey Church. Pastor Vince concludes our Song of Songs focus with some practical ways to resolve conflict the biblical way. When it comes to the subject of resolving conflict, we as Christians probably do not practice this biblically like we should. In fact, I believe if we followed some of these principles that I'm about to outline to us this morning that um, we would see less hurt, we would see less trauma, we would see less church splits, we would see less divorces, we would see less conflict in the body of believers than we do today. I didn't say none, but I would say less. And so with that, we're going to quote the famous theologian, Pat Benatar, who said, we are strong. No one can tell us we're wrong. Ooh, sounds like church right there. (laughs) Uh, Searching our hearts for so long, both, both of us knowing. What do we know? Love is a battlefield. This morning, I want us to let our hair down if we can. You might just turn to your neighbor and say, hey, we're going to have fun this morning. How are we going to have fun? Well, I believe we have fun by learning some things. How many of you already learned some things? Okay, wonderful. Now, um, in the Psych Central October 22 um, article, uh, so just, just last year, not even a whole year ago, They listed 10 reasons why people end their marriage. And I just want to give you the top three. Uh, 73% of relationships end because of a lack of commitment. Um, In other words, a diminished desire to put the effort in making it work. 55% said that there was too much arguing and conflict. Constant fighting about sex, money, and other relationship issues. And then 54% because of infidelity. Now, when I was doing some research about what causes people to dissolve their relationship, I found these top three things in every list. And most of them cycled or were interchangeable. And so when it comes to this basis of how do we go the distance with not only our spouse, but how do we go to the distance with our church family? How do we go the distance at our job when there's conflict? How do we we go the distance in our families when they're upheaval and we don't always see eye to eye on issues? Here's what we need to understand that that you and I, we will encounter conflict in every relationship. What you and I need to do is redefine the purpose of conflict. Now think about that for a second. Because I think we all would say, well, the reason why we have conflict is because one of us is right and one of us is wrong. And I'm always right, so they're always wrong. And we come to conflict in, in our marriage, in our church, in our job with this idea someone is right and someone is wrong. And we need to teach the people that are wrong to quit being wrong. Right? <laughs> I love um, what Jordan Peterson says. He says, what makes you think That if you had everything you asked for, that you'd be satisfied. Ouch. And when I look at the Christian faith, what Jesus teaches us, he teaches us things like um, self-control. He teaches us things like dying to self. 
In fact, let me just interject. This is a free, it's not in my notes, but one of the biggest lies that our culture is teaching people today is be true to yourself. That is a lie. <laughs> what we need is to die to self. Because when we die to self, we're choosing to serve other people above ourselves. And so, so with this idea, issues that come up in relationships, whatever relationship you want to talk about this morning, family, parent to child, boss to employee, church family, whatever relationship. Here's what I want to encourage you to redefine conflict about. Here's three questions. Question number one, this issue that we're having, is this an issue that will help me to grow to become more like Jesus? Ask yourself that. This conflict I've got with my spouse, with my pastor, with, with my boss, with my children, is this an issue that I can become more like Jesus over? Second question, is this an issue that I can display my love to the other person better? Give you all time to write that down. Is this an issue that I can do a better job at displaying love to this person about? Or here's the third question. Is this an indicator, this conflict we're going through, is this an indicator that our time together is coming to an end? Now, these are sobering thoughts, but they will help us fortify as believers. And, and again, as a pastor talking about marriage, I rarely think that last question is the answer, unless there's other things involved and we won't get into that. Again, hear my heart. But I think the first two questions that we have to ask ourselves, that when we're in conflict with one another, what if we came to the table and said, the reason why we're in this conflict <laughs> is because I want what I want and you want what you want, but maybe this gives us both an opportunity to see how can we become more like Jesus. Because when I want what I want and my wife want what she wants, and we have a, an end goal of who's going to be right, who's going to be wrong, it, it never ends well. But if we come to the table with this idea of how can I outserve you? How can I do a better job at loving you? How can I do a better job at being more like Jesus? Then the moment I start to think how can I do better at being more like Jesus, it automatically causes me to take a step back from being right. Here's some things I would encourage you to do to resolve conflict with your spouse, to resolve conflict with your boss, to resolve conflict with your children, and especially those of you here that you've got brothers and sisters. This is a huge way to resolve conflict. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Number one, avoid the ceasefire trap. What happens a lot of times is when people get in an argument, especially when it's the same thing over and over again, is they will say things to just cease fire. I'm tired of fighting about this. So they say things like, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, you're right, whatever. Let's just move on. And that's a ceasefire. In fact, what typically happens is we don't properly know how to repent about an issue. So you and I, as sinners coming to faith, it says that what should have happened is by God's kindness, we realized who we are and we came to repentance. Repentance. If you're here this morning and you've just always grown up in church and you've never repented, you're not a Christian, you're a churchgoer. And so this morning, let me help you understand what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian means I, Vince Farrell, came to the understanding that, that I was a sinner, that I was 
not right with God because my sin separated me from God. And because of that, I had to repent. I had to come to God and ask for forgiveness. Admit that I was a sinner and say to him, God, my sin crucified Christ. And because of that, I'm asking you to forgive me. And because of his loving kindness and faithfulness, he forgave me. And because of that forgiveness, I'm now compelled to not want to do those things that originally put Christ on the cross to begin with. Does that make sense? In other words, confessing my sin, realizing that what I have done is what caused Christ to to die, and now I want to live a life that is pleasing to God that no longer resembles my old life. That's called repentance. And so we have to take the same approach when it comes to our relationships with one another. So when you're in an argument with someone, your boss, your children, your sibling, your spouse, when you're in an argument, don't settle for, let's just forget about this. I'm tired of arguing about this. A ceasefire. Instead, move into repentance, which means... Someone in this argument needs to assume responsibility. See, Jesus took responsibility for my sin. He wasn't wrong. I was wrong. But he took responsibility for it. And so you, let's just use this example between a husband and wife. In an argument, one of us has to come to each other and say, you know what, I hadn't thought about it from that angle. And so I want you to know I, w- I was wrong for saying that. I was wrong for doing that. I was wrong. And you, you take the responsibility. I shouldn't have said that to you. I shouldn't have acted that way towards you. And, and so I just want you to know I was wrong taking responsibility. When you say that to the person, I was wrong. I ask you to forgive me. That person now has a job to do. They can forgive you, which if they're a Christian, should go hands down without argument. Or they can choose not to forgive you. And at that point, you're going to need lots and lots of counseling. If you got someone in the relationship that's unforgiving, you're in trouble. But... If that person says, I appreciate you admitting that you were wrong, I, 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 I forgive you. At that point, there should be emotional releasing of that debt. And so now, you both are able to walk in the last stage of this repentance, which is changed behavior. Isn't that the goal? I'll give you time. You're writing so profusely. I'll I'll give you time. I know all this is too much to write down in one setting. That is the foundation of conflict resolution. Now think just real quick how opposite that is of what we do in our culture. We have conflict and what do we do? We unfriend them. We have conflict. What do we do? I quit this job. We have conflict. What do we do? I'm going to another church. God called me. Did I just do air quotes out loud? In my mind, I was thinking it, but I didn't know if I just did it out loud. Sorry about that. We'll edit that out, I guess. But we don't don't conflict resolve very well. Somehow God calls us to other places. Somehow we just get a different job because our boss is such a... But as believers... If we have been forgiven, then we have to forgive. As a Christian, we have been forgiven. We have to forgive. I'm getting there, y'all. The saddest, the saddest counseling I've ever done is sitting with an individual 
who's told me what was done to them. And yeah, they were hurt. And yeah, they were wronged. And them saying the phrase, but I just can't forgive them. And me having to follow that up with, then you're not a Christian. Just so you know, Christians have to forgive. It's not a luxury to hold it over someone's head what they did for you. And really, you're not holding over their head. You're, you're captivating your own heart. You're putting your own life in chains. Because living with unforgiveness only causes you to live in bondage, not them. So we do this in the same way in every relationship. No matter how wrong they did to you, we as believers, because we've been forgiven, we must forgive. Number two, quickly resolve conflict or the issue at hand as quickly as possible. I give you a scripture verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, says, And do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Now, this scripture has been quoted in every marriage book you can ever think of about before the night ends, make sure you resolve the issue. But let me give some, I believe, fresh revelation on this. Because the sun not only represents a day, it also represents a season. It also represents a night. There have been times, believe it or not, that Laura and I have been in such a heated argument that it go one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, because of this thinking of, we got to resolve this now. And until I came up with this revelation that a sun doesn't just mean day, it also means season, then taking the time to say to one another, listen, you and I are emotionally spent on this. Let's get a good night's rest, and we'll pick this up at a later time. And those have been some of the best decisions we've ever made in an argument setting. Sometimes you are too emotionally spent to properly end an argument at four in the morning. And the best thing you need to do is go to sleep, get a good night's rest, resolving the issue at hand means it's going to be tempted for you to bring up other issues. So here's some things that how to resolve the issue at hand. Number one, never say the words always and never. Oh, this is just like you. You are always. Mm, no, don't do that. Oh, I should have known because you never. Mm, don't do that. Address the issue at hand. Don't bring in the past Dr. Gottman, who I've quoted many times, calls this toxic criticism. In other words, when you're, when you're contempt, when you're talking to someone, you're rolling your eyes about, oh yeah, I've heard this before. That's contempt. Don't do that. Don't character bash. When you say the words always and never, you're attacking their character. Don't do that. Even if it's true, don't do it. Because what you're doing is you're locking them into an attitude that no matter what they do, it's not good enough for you. Because you're keeping score. You've kept an always list and a never list. And this is just another time that they're always a never. Don't do that. And then lastly, don't bring up things from the past that you said you've forgiven. When you say things like, you know, I'm sorry, you're right, will you forgive me? Yes, I forgive you. And then three months later, that same situation happens, and you say something to the effect of, yeah, just like last time, and I had to, whoa, 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 there's no last time. Forgiveness means you're not keeping record. So what last time? If you bring up last time, that what you're saying is you didn't really forgive them. You were just ceasing fire. Good preaching. Thank you. With this understanding of wanting to resolve the issue by serving each other, loving each other better, 
One of the things that I'm starting to practice in our latter years of relationship is when there's an argument and it's not getting resolved before the sun goes down, take a time out and, and, and just say, hey, can we time out real quick? I don't feel like I'm doing a, a justice right now. And, and what I want to do is, is I want to cool down And we'll come back to this later. Because if we don't, my emotions are getting up and amped. And and I don't want to say something to you that I will later regret. In other words, talk to each other. Take an opportunity to say, listen, right now, I, I, I know that I could say something that would hurt you. And I don't want to do that. And if you love each other enough, you'll be able to look at each other and say, Absolutely, not a problem. Let's, let's go to our corners, ding, ding, ding. The bell is out. Let's go and take a break. Because it's not about being right or wrong. It's about being more like Jesus. Number three, have a grace-filled complaint department or service department. Have a grace-filled service department. I think we'd all been to some place that customer service was lackluster. Anyone? You ever go to some place and they look at you like you're the problem? Yeah, I was supposed to get curly fries. You and the other individual needs to be able to approach you without you flying off the handle. If you're flying off the handle over every little thing, I would encourage you, spend some time asking Jesus to come in your heart. Because the goal in conflict resolution is a process of repair. There's been an offense. There's been a misunderstanding. There's been something that was said that maybe there's miscommunication there. Whatever the issue is, you've got to be able to be loving enough, compassionate enough, that when someone approaches you and says, you hurt my feelings, you you're not doing this properly. I need the cups to be on the top of the dishwasher, whatever it is. That your go-to reaction is not, quit telling me what to do. Why are you always coming down on me? Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, don't fly off the handle. Ask questions like, what did I say that hurt you? Because I, I didn't even realize I said it that way. What did I say that hurt you? You know, in hearing you talk, what's a way that I can handle that better? I want, to, I want you to feel safe around me. And so, could you help me process some things that you're processing? Help me to understand how you heard me say that. And here's number four. Talk the language that they hear. Now, this is extremely important for husbands and wives, but for all of us, because we all hear out of four basic ears, honor, respect, security, and value. It doesn't mean you don't disagree. In fact, I've discovered in my own life that disagreement but said with respect is how you find the best of things. It's what I love about getting to serve with so many different people here on staff is we all come from a different ideology of how it should be done or could be done. And a lot of times there will be difference of opinions on how to do things. And when there's disagreement, but it's done with respect, then the best happens. That's why I say over and over again, I think we have a phenomenal church here 
And the reason why we have a phenomenal church here is because the leadership that makes up this church, even though we have different ideas and theologies and backgrounds, we all come to the table with respect and honor for one another. We all come to the table for security and a sense of value for each other. Husbands and wives do the same thing. See, people, according to Dr. Grotman, he says this, people can change only when they basically feel liked and accepted as they are. If you're constantly coming to your children, trying to change them, change them, change them, change them, change them, do this better, do this better, then they feel like you don't genuinely like them for who they are. When your spouse feels like, I want you to do this, 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 change this, I wish you do this more, they feel like you don't basically like them for who they are. It doesn't mean we don't change. Of course we do. We're growing. We're maturing. We want to be more like Jesus. But do they feel like they valued? Do they feel like they're important? Wives, let me say it to you this way. You can say anything to your husband because you're his equal. And after you do, then you need to give it to the Holy Spirit. Because if you continue saying that thing to your husband over and over and over again, he's going to start quoting Proverbs, better to be in harmony than with a nagging wife. When, when you keep going and going and going over an issue, ladies, you become nagging instead of fulfilling. What do you mean, Pastor Vince? Great question. I'm glad you asked. Once you've said something to your spouse, who's the enforcer? You or the Holy Spirit? If you keep doing it, then you become the enforcer and you leave no room for the Holy Spirit and you will end up driving a wedge in that relationship. But if what you said is true, then the Holy Spirit, who is what? The Spirit of truth, he will enforce it to your husband and he will, if your husband is sensitive to the Holy Spirit, he will then make the change because what you said is true. Pray after the fight. See, if we've done these things properly, then there should be repentance and reconciliation. And that's when we can go to each other and say, in all pureness of our heart, honey, let's pray. I thank you for my spouse. I thank you for my kids. I thank you for my church leader. I thank you. And you can together in fullness of restoration be able to pray blessings to them. It's hard to stay mad at someone if you truly love them and want the best for them. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you for joining us at Journey Church. Our hope is that these messages challenge your soul, equip your spirit, and give you a hope for your future. For more information about our church, visit us at OurJourney.tv. We look forward to doing life with you. Now, let's go this week and be the church in our community as we focus on loving God and loving others. See you next week.